Hello, I'm Rupert Sheldrake. I'm here with Mark Vernon uh, for another of our uh, dialogues. Uh, we talk to each other from time to time about things we're interested in, things that have been happening in our lives, books we've been reading, ideas we're wrestling with. And we hope that these conversations will help other people to um, follow along with their own thoughts and in discussions with their friends. So it's good to be together again, Mark. Yeah, nice to see you, Rupert. Um, Mark, what I wanted to talk about today was that uh, the subject of psychical research or parapsychology. Uh, the reason uh, it's foremost in my mind at the moment is I've just returned from uh, a seminar in Paris, uh, which was convened by a number of parapsychologists um, who are interested in possible theories to explain phenomena like telepathy, um, precognition, presentiment, and so on. Um, this was a meeting of the main people who've got theories. There were only about 15 people. The idea was to keep it small, a discussion group. There was no public. It wasn't so it was a private seminar. Um, and it was, in fact, a very interesting and revealing discussion. And what it makes clear is, of course, that the the existence of these phenomena, which most people take for granted because they experience them, um, uh, does provide a huge challenge for the materialist worldview, which is precisely why they're so controversial. Uh, and there were several categories of theory there. Um, there were a few people who've uh, got theories based on quantum physics that they feel that by extending quantum physics, uh, we can uh, explain some parapsychological phenomena. And the general argument there is that quantum physics allows for reverse causation in time. Richard Feynman, the famous quantum physicist, um, uh, gave a series of diagrams, Feynman diagrams, that show that many quantum processes can be considered to be processes moving backwards in time. Uh, for example, a positron, a positively charged electron, is equivalent to an electron moving from the future towards the past. Um, so um, these theories thought by extending quantum theory, it might be possible to explain precognition or retrocausal events, things that work backwards from the future. And they were trying to explain all psychic phenomena in terms of retrocausation. Well, that was one point of view. There are others there, including me, who don't think all psychic phenomena are examples of retrocausation. I mean, precognitive dreams may be, uh, but um, the sense of being stared at, knowing when you're being looked at by somebody, um, telepathy, like a dog knowing when its owner's coming home, or someone anticipating who's about to ring them on the phone while that person forms an intention to call them, or mothers picking up when their babies need them, um, many mothers have a milk let down reflex when their baby is crying miles away. Um, these uh, examples of common everyday telepathy in people and in animals um, suggest an immediate effect, not just a retrocausal one. So there are other theories like my own, which is about the extended mind. Our minds extend as field-like extensions beyond our brains, um, just like mobile phones have invisible field-like extensions beyond the phone, which is why they work. and it's, uh, The Earth has fields extending invisibly beyond it. It's electrical and magnetic fields and, of course, the gravitational field. Um, and I also think that within the universe there's a memory principle, morphic resonance, which holds things together and is, it involves the transfer of memory, which is relevant to some psychic phenomena. Um, and then there were some theories of new visions of cosmology where the the main uh, theories in contemporary physics about the nature of ultimate reality, which are M-theory and superstring theory, have 10 and 11 dimensions in them. So there are these underemployed extra dimensions in these physical models, which are they're the majority view. These are not some kind of crank theories. The majority, something like eighty percent of theoretical physics is concerned with these multi-dimensional models. Um, so uh, there were some models there that had a combination of 
consciousness linked throughout the universe through these extra dimensions, including something like morphic resonance. Um, and because these extra dimensions allow for connections in time and in space, um, they might provide an understanding of psychic phenomena. So those were the kinds of th- ideas that were being discussed. But interestingly, as a backdrop, at exactly the same time, um, an article is just about to appear in the American Psychologist magazine, and um, there's a preview of it in the current issue of the Skeptical Inquirer, which is the main skeptical journal, by two of the leading veteran skeptics, James Alcock and Arthur Reber, um, uh, which shows the kind of so-called skeptical position in its most dogmatic backlash. And what they actually said is this. Um, uh, the recent... The, the background to this is that the American Psychologist magazine, which is, goes out to a, the 120,000 members of the American Psychological Association, published a review article summarizing uh, evidence for psychic phenomena from hundreds, if not thousands, of studies in peer-reviewed journals based on meta-analyses bringing together all these data, showing astonishingly positive effects when you take all the data into consideration. And here's uh, what Reber and Alcock say in um, their article in American Psychologist. Recently, American Psychologist published a review of the evidence for parapsychology that supported the general claims of psi, the umbrella term often used for anomalous or paranormal phenomena. We present an opposing perspective and a broad-based critique of the entire parapsychology enterprise Our position is straightforward. Claims made by parapsychologists cannot be true. The effects reported can have no ontological status. The data have no existential value. And so they then wrote um, an article about this in the Skeptical Inquirer. And what they said about their paper in The American Psychologist is... We did not examine the data for Psy to the consternation of the parapsychologist who was one of the reviewers. Our reason was simple. The data are irrelevant. Um, These uh, data that show that Psy phenomena exist uh, are the result of flawed methodology, weak controls, inappropriate data analysis, or fraud. So what we've got here is an example of the dogmatic backlash against these phenomena, where, as far as they're concerned, the data are irrelevant. I think that this is actually a kind of tension within the sceptic movement. Some so-called sceptics um, consider that the data are relevant, they just think they're not good enough. Um, but for the more extreme sceptics like them, uh, it doesn't matter what data you have, what experiments you do, what phenomena exist. It doesn't matter if the vast majority of people claim to have had these experiences they're impossible. So what we have here is, in, in my own um, experience in the last few days, there's been uh, this extreme contrast between open-minded scientists exploring areas we don't understand with a range of theories, talking to each other in a kind of collaborative and friendly way, all ag- agreeing there's a great deal we don't understand and we're all making efforts to try and make sense of it. And on the other hand, this purely dogmatic approach, which still um, is what contain, what commands credibility in the mainstream of science, uh, even though it's so unscientific. Um, and that's the position we're in at the moment. And it's not irrelevant to the discussions that we've been having about uh, materialist theories of history, the sense of lack of meaning and the crisis that we find ourselves in at the moment. Yes, and um, I mean, what's so striking about what you say about the rebuttal, the sceptical rebuttal, um, is that they, first of all, say, you know, there cannot be significance to this evidence um, because of an ontological prior commitment. Um, but also when they say that um, any seeming results are because of things like flawed controls. Well, what struck me is, uh, you can correct me if I've got this wrong, but I think the original article summarising all the metadata in American Psychologist um, it either was written by or included a quote from Jessica Utz, 
who's that was the president or if not now but what certainly was the president of the professional body for um all statisticians yes so if anyone knows about controls she knows about controls yeah and she precisely said the evidence is there um so it's not like that um the the skeptics are pointing out something that hasn't been thoroughly considered already in the meta-analysis and by the best experts in the field as well I know. And the other thing is that these two so-called skeptics are both psychologists, professors of psychology, and they claim that these phenomena are impossible because of physics. I mean, they, they admit they don't, they're not physicists. So they're basing their claim on the authority of physics without being physicists, um, which is, again, rather odd, because some of the people at this meeting I've been at are physicists, and are actually very interested in psychic phenomena and think that physics contains so many um, unexplained aspects, including these peculiar time reversal effects, the extra dimensions in modern superstring and M theory, etc., um, that there's uh, plenty of room for including consciousness and um, psychic phenomena in an expanded version of physics. Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether picking up on um, some of the theories then that you did here um, and, um, you know, in your own, because um, it's really fascinating to hear how the people that do know this world inside and out are actually thinking about it where they've got to. Mm. Um, I mean, you've you've been in this area for a long time and, and have your um, own proposal as well, as you were saying, um, with a slightly sceptical hat on for me, not because I don't think things like telepathy and so on exist. I mean, I, I think that they're self-evidently the case if you pay attention to life in mm. that way. Um, but um, in terms of trying to explain them, um, I always get a bit nervous with the physics because on the one hand, um, there's so uh, uh, much that's not understood about modern physics or what it means. Um, but that in itself means if you try and it were... Um, press too much on it, then you're sort of skating on thin ice as well, um, because the physics might well evolve. Um, the ontological status of quantum mechanics, for example, might become much clearer. It might become more settled. And then the idea that consciousness might be able to weave itself th through higher dimensions um, in mm. string theory or M theory, and that might uh, become less plausible with time. So I, I, whilst um, not being a sceptic in the sense of uh, denying these things occur, I, I am wary when physics um, is is um, looked to to try and provide some account for them. Mm. It's not to say you shouldn't look to physics to do so, um, but, um, uh, you know, was this that sense of wariness too? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was the only biologist there, and I certainly thought that. You know, I thought, you know, my starting point was we don't need to try and start from physics to explain these phenomena because quantum physics is the physics of the very, very small. And we don't look to physics to explain, you know, the mating behavior of bower birds or the um, functioning of the liver or something. We don't explain even the most simple things about biology or complex behaviors or the development of plants. We don't instantly go to quantum physics for any of these phenomena. Um, so there's no reason to think that for psychic phenomena we've got to go immediately to quantum physics or even to cosmology or super string theory. The vast majority of medicine, biology, uh, sociology, psychology don't invoke physics. They just explain things at their own level in their own way. So um, I myself was making a case that we actually need to ground our understanding of these things in biology and evolution that psychic phenomena are to do with telepathy is to do with relations between members of social groups. And there are many social groups in nature, flocks of birds, termite colonies, etc., which involve what appear to be mysterious connections between members of the group. And that telepathy has an evolutionary origin in those phenomena. The sense of being stared at is to do with the way that vision works, that the all organisms project out visual images um, to where the thing they're seeing is, and an ability to pick up their mental projections or perceptual projections uh, enables organisms to know when they're being looked at. So my, my attempt was to put it in a largely biological context and rather resisting the imperialism of physics. So I, I agree with you on that. Um, so... Uh, what none of these theories, interestingly, did, and, and this came up in the discussion, 
was start from a kind of panpsychist view. They were all based on old-style physics, which assumes that the entire universe is unconscious, and you have all these superstring theories and M theories and dark matter and all that, uh, but the whole thing lacks consciousness. In fact, consciousness just doesn't come into regular physics. It only comes into quantum physics peripherally because you have to have observations, and observations imply conscious observers. Um, so... Although there was an attempt, but particularly by Bernard Carr, who's a, a British cosmologist, to find a place for consciousness and psychic phenomena in superstring and M theory, um, this was it was something that could move towards a panpsychist view. But still, most of this thinking is in the old model of unconscious physical universe. Yeah, just as an aside, um, I know Bernard Carr as well, and uh, he once told me this uh, very funny story about how he had been sat next to Stephen Hawking at the premiere of the film about Hawking's life, A Theory of Everything, and had quipped that the one thing that the film was actually about, which was about basically Stephen Hawking's um, rom romance with his wife, it was about love, um, that was the, one of the many things that Stephen Hawking's Theory of Everything couldn't begin to account for. Um, because, yes. you know, love is nothing if it's not a phenomenon of consciousness. Yes. Um, so it's nice to think of these two eminent physicists sat next to each other in the seminar, sort of in a way discussing these things. Yes. Um, but I, I'm, I'm interested too that time comes into it because I, not as a, I mean, I did an undergraduate physics degree, but I'm in no sense a physicist. Um, but I do increasingly wonder whether time itself is something that's not fundamentally a physical property. Um, that the, the, the T equals two e, as it were, of, 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 uh, physics, physics is a rather reduced, um, kind of time, a sort of convenience, um, a bit like we have calendar time as a sort of convenience so we can say where something is. Um, but that time in its fullest sense, um, is actually, um, maybe a biological or even a psychological property. Um, because, you know, the way we experience time, um, suggests that it doesn't tick by fundamentally second by second um, but you know sometimes time goes in a flash we're in states of flow for example at other times time uh, feels very slow um, at other times again it feels like there's not really that much difference between the past and the present um, they're much more coterminous than we otherwise might think and I also wonder whether the future too um, is much nearer to us um, and, and experience a presentiment and so on a part of that um, so, yeah, I wonder whether we need um, a kind of emergent uh, accounts of time or um, we need to approach things like time, as you're saying, um, with biology um, at the right level. Um, mm -hmm. And that that perhaps will be one of the things which might emerge and that much as you say, no one would think to explain um, flocks of birds by looking at the atoms of birds. So, mm -hmm. too, in time, boom, boom, and we will stop thinking about time as if it's fundamentally a physical property mm. with a bit of hand-waving around entropy or something, um, which is, tends to be what happens now, um, and and start to realise that it's a, a property of experience in the cosmos that actually its proper place is at a higher level of organisation and maybe even at a conscious level of organisation. That's its natural home. Well, yes, that, I think that's partly true, but it, in the in the Big Bang cosmology, the principal arrow of time is the expansion of the universe. So there is a process underlying the growth of the universe which makes time asymmetric. It started small, it's getting bigger. And in a sense that's mirrored mer in the growth of all living organisms. We start small and we get bigger as fertilized eggs. We grow up and plants start from seeds and grow up. I mean, living organisms grow up, they don't grow down. There seems to be an asymmetry in developmental processes, both in organisms and in the whole universe, which in that sense is rather like an, a gigantic organism. So that's one aspect of time that uh, is very different from the kind of reversible Newtonian mechanics where things in principle could go equally well in both directions. I think what, one thing that came up in our discussions was the um, the different flow directions of time. Um, and this is something which I find very interesting in philosophy of Whitehead, and it relates to panpsychism. Um, as you know, Whitehead thought that the all processes in nature 
are processes an electron is a process it's not a thing matter is not stuff that just endures it's pro- vibratory processes and because an electron an atom everything's a vibratory process it has a past pole and a future pole there's a polarity in time and whitehead's view was that regular physical causation is working from the past towards the future whereas mental causation the causation to do with goals ends purposes choices is working from the virtual future backwards towards the past and that they overlap in the present so that the relation between mind and body is not between inside and outside or usually we think of it in spatial metaphors but in time and so the movement of conscious causation is from the future you know towards the past and that these two flows of causation somehow overlap um that seems to me a much better way of thinking about um consciousness and conscious causation because consciousness according to white uh, whitehead is primarily about possibilities and choosing about possibilities um and the future is open all conscious beings and even unconscious beings with a mental life and most habits are unconscious and most of our own mental life is unconscious are still goal directed and the goal exists in the future and that it which can be modeled as an attractor uh, works back by uh, affecting what we do for example at this conference in paris all of us had formed the plan to go to the conference which before we got there was in the future it was our goal um and we all decided to do it and we all went there and this attractor of being in this particular building in paris on a particular day attracted us and my eurostar train was late and then the metro was blocked in paris and so there were obstacles in my path but i was determined to get there and i got there um a bit late um but the the so this future what was a future goal is a kind of attractor that affects our behavior um and that whether the goals are conscious or unconscious there's this kind of flow of causation working backwards in time yeah i mean just as an aside again i i think it's worth stressing too that citing whitehead is very significant um because although he's not so well known now i don't think um he was it's it was said to be one of perhaps just a handful of mathematicians who really understood what einstein was going on about in 1905 um and so his theories are not sort of speculations they're very very serious and deep attempts to grapple with the revolution that came with einstein's both the, oh, the, yes. the, the relativistic and the quantum theories well he had a theory of gravity as well it was a kind of rival to einstein's for a while it was a different mathematical theory of gravity because he was a very accomplished mathematician he got it straight away and in the 1920s whitehead realized that quantum physics was saying that matter is a process the world's made of processes not stuff that materialism dissolved into processes now it took most philosophers decades uh, to catch up with that and you know popular books about quantum theory like fritjof capra the tower physics i think it was 1974 or something but whitehead sort of got there straight away in the 1920s and was already years decades ahead of the game in discussing these things in fact it's only now really in the 21st century that his um, ideas are really being taken seriously enough to apply them and 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 work out what they what they could um, imply another reason why I like uh, the idea of it um this idea of the the future is a sort of flow towards us um with the kind of potential being made actual you might say mm-hmm. um is that um again it brings in for me something which i find very compelling in the area of psi and and the, it's particularly the psychology of psi um and i'm thinking particularly of the work of someone like jeffrey kripal in the us and one of the things which he is very um keen on is the idea that you've got to build in some sort of reflexivity um into say presentiment um so what he means by that is that um if something is flowing to us perhaps from the future um what who we are as antennae you might say to receive that really matters as well and so we can only receive um something from the future or elsewhere um in ways that we can actually uh, envisage it can comprehend it 
Mm. Um, so he, you know, he would, he, he's on, he, he's very interested, for example, in often how people have um, presentiment about, well, not often, but occasionally you do you know, come across people who have very um, well established presentiments, say, of future events, um, like even plane crashes. Yeah. And what he notices is that, um, what they tend to experience as their presentiment, um, is an image which, for example, the next day they then see on the television. Mm. And the way he understands that um, is that um, they're not, as it were, getting the raw um, data of this uh, future event unfolding, but what they're getting um, is the way that they will then experience um, themselves through the television uh, that raw event. Um, and so I very much like this idea um, that within psychology um, there's this reflexivity and um, that we um, receive um, information, communications, whether it be from the future or from others, for our own filters um, in the way that um, we can understand that. And it, it makes sense to me as a psychotherapist because one of the things which you do as a psychotherapist um, in what's called the transference and the countertransference, which for me dovetail into telepathic phenomena of one sort or another, um, is that you train yourself to recognise how you receive that information, particularly in feelings in your body or uh, mm. transferential emotions and so on. Mm. So you learn how you respond to what's coming from elsewhere in order to then interpret it and, and hopefully make it of use to the person that you're, the people that you're working with. Yes, I think that's very interesting. I mean, the ability to feel it seems to be um, related to having that experience in the future. And some people have suggested that we should call these phenomena pre-call, because it's like the opposite of recall. Memory is when we, as it were, resonate with ourselves in the past. This is when we, as it were, resonate with ourselves in the future. Um, and it's interesting, this too is biological, it's not confined to humans. And as you know, I've spent years looking at animal warnings of earthquakes and tsunamis, that the enormous amount of evidence for well, from thousands of years, um, and from contemporary cases too, of animals picking up several days in advance when a major disaster like an earthquake is going to happen. No one knows how they do it, but there's a sense in which they're experiencing the distress that they're going to experience in the future now and responding to it, often in ways that get them out of the way of danger. In the great tsunami a few years ago, um, there were many cases of animals um, moving to higher ground before this huge tidal wave hit the areas near the shore. Um, <coughs> so um, there's something about the nature of time that it, it, where we're connected with our own futures. And collectively, presumably, we're connected with our own futures. And I suppose that one of the features of uh, the more optimistic view of history that comes in uh, in religious perspectives, or at least those that have an optimistic view of the future, which I think Christianity does and Islam and uh, Judaism, um, Hinduism and Buddhism don't particularly. They see the world declining, or at least Theravada Buddhism and Hinduism see things getting worse until the universe is dissolved. Tibetan Buddhists see the liberation of all sentient beings as a kind of future goal. That when there is this optimistic future, that this can actually work on people in the present as they feel themselves connected with things getting better. Like in the Christian idea of the coming of the kingdom of heaven. Um, this leads to the idea that there can be a time when people live in harmony, brotherhood, and help each other much more than they do at present. And I think actually in its secularized forms that that has led to things like the welfare state in many European countries and the fact that people are much more inclusive and 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 kind to each other than they used to be in all sorts of ways. Yeah, I mean, you remind me of St. Paul's comments even in in the Bible are talking about it's, this isn't just uh, individuals desiring God, it's the cosmos itself reaching back to the Creator. Mm. Um, and certainly... Um, in my own book, forthcoming, a secret history, secret history of Christianity, um, through I think particularly romantic science actually. Um, so this is figures like Goethe, um, like von Humboldt. Um, this uh, alternative to the sort of stripped down reductive tradition in science um, that that sees science that the the, um, the ideas in science as arising out of a kind of emergence in the soul of the cosmos, you might say. 
Um, so notions like ecology, for example, which is one of von Humboldt's ideas, um, he got the idea that, that the world can be, the natural world can be envisaged as an ecosystem. And because he tried to immerse himself profoundly at a felt level um, within various natural environments as he travelled across the world. Um, and it's from that felt level, that sense of cosmic striving and vitality, that then the more uh, rarefied scientific notions like ecology start to emerge. Mm. So that kind of reconnection um, with this deep impulse um, is not just actually a religious idea, though I think it is. I actually wonder whether it lies at the heart of a lot of science, too. Mm. Um, it's just that that tends to get forgotten in the official accounts. Yeah, I agree. In fact, um, a biography of von Humboldt is on my summer reading list, so I hope we'll have a chance to talk more about that uh, later this year. Well, that'd be great. Well, thanks very much. I mean, thanks very much for giving us that insight into that, that meeting, uh, which we otherwise wouldn't know about, and it's been really fascinating to talk about what, they, what was being said. Thank you.